So Seamus, how are you doing this week? I am proud to report that 90% of my organs are working just fine. <laughs> Man. Hey, did you know that when you're born, you have four kidneys? No. Yeah, except as you grow up, two of them become adult knees. <laughs> Sorry. That was uncalled for. <laughs> Oh, man. Might have become old man knees. <laughs> they're, they're, oh, you only have two now, huh? Right. Uh, well, speaking of things that are old and worn out, I've been watching a bunch of anime recently. Oh? Uh, okay, tell me about that. Well, I mean, there's not much. You know, it's, it's anime, so... Uh, I, I watched the whole series of Aria, A-R-I-A, and uh, that was lovely. It's got no fan service. It's got no fighting. It's just... Wait a minute, wait a minute. You just told me it was great, and then you told me, you gave me two reasons why it wasn't. <laughs> I didn't say it was great. I said it was lovely. I don't know. No fan service. No, no, and no, an anime that's no fan service and no fighting. Was it just a blank screen for an entire episode? I'm having <laughs> trouble picturing this. Lots of landscapes and water. Um, it's like, imagine, uh, fully dressed women in gondolas, uh, going, rowing around Venice. That's basically, that's basically the whole show. Actually, that, that actually sounds super relaxing. Like, I, I joke, but yeah, there are some of those animes that are just wonderful, like, the, the anime equivalent of just putting on some really chill music and sitting outside for a while. Yeah, yeah. Watching the sunset kind of thing. I, I think my w wife watched it some years ago, and I like saw it out of the corner of my eye. I'm like, what is this? This looks boring, right? But then years later, I'm like, you know, this is really nice. Right. So speaking of things that are really nice, I heard that you've been uh, struggling with Xbox again. Oh my gosh. Before I do that rant, I have to do a different rant. While you were talking oh, about the anime, while we were having this conversation, um... My push to talk key is shift. And so if I have a lot of false starts in a row, like I'm going to speak, but then you start speaking. So I let off the button, but then I try and speak, but then you, you know, <laughs> you do uh -huh. that like four or five uh -huh. times in a row. And Windows is like, oh, you press the sticky keys. Oh, you want to do squeaky? It beeps and it does this pop up and it gets in your face. And it's like, oh, you're, and I know I've turned it off. So it must be, it turns itself on during Windows updates. Windows wouldn't want you to be stuck without being able to hold the shift key. Right. And it, it's very frustrating. It is very <laughs> frustrating. Like, because stuff like that happens a lot when you're a gamer. Like, you're yeah, pressing yeah. a weird key ten times in a row. Just this game happens to, like, use that for something and so you're in the middle of a game and all of a sudden it's like are you trying to type but your body doesn't work right here let me help you by changing the entire way you interface with your operating system <laughs> are you in distress ah. anyway that's speaking there's help available Seamus <laughs> right <laughs> It's like you walk into a room and you can't find a chair and all of a sudden a bunch of orderlies come in with a with a wheelchair and throw you into it it's, wait, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> we saw that you wanted to sit down. D uh, don't strain yourself, sir. We don't want you to get hurt. <laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah, this is a great segue. Anyway, speaking of horrible interfaces designed by Microsoft, I subscribe to Xbox Game Pass for PC, which is, of course, oxymoronic. You know, <laughs> Coke for Pepsi. It's, it makes no sense. It's nonsense. There's are two different platforms, but whatever. I subscribe to it, and, you know, you pay the monthly fee, and you get access to all these games. Right. It's not even Coke for Pepsi. It's like Coke for French fries. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> so you download a game, right? You're like, oh, this looks like a good game that's covered on Game Pass, which means I can play it for free. You install it, you run it, and once the game is running, you know, you endure the long loading screen, and the game pops up. The game 
pops up title screen. Okay, I'm ready to interact, and then all of a sudden, another, like, Windows pop-up covers the game. Hey, w you know, identify yourself, and it has my Xbox <laughs> login again. And it's like, uh -huh. I was just logged in. I would not have been able to launch this game if I was not logged in as me. But it's like trying to figure out who I am for save game data. Except you should already know who I am because I'm the guy that's allowed to play this game. That I'm paying you money so I'm allowed to play this game. Uh. So it's just stupid. Like, And if you do need to have that dialogue, why don't you have it? before I launch the game, rather than launch the game and then have a Windows pop-up cover the game. So I'm like, right. yes, yes, it's it's me, it's Seamus, fine, click, go away. All right, and then another pop-up comes up. No, they, they stack. There were two. One stacks on top of the other. <laughs> on top one of asks each me, other. One asks me to identify myself, and the other one asks me if it's if I give this game permission to make changes to my device. And I'm like, I in, I deliberately clicked the button to install it. I downloaded, no, I paid you $10 last month. Then I clicked on the button to install this. I waited for it to download and then I launched it. If, if I don't want it making changes to my computer, then it's too late. I have already messed up. The fact that I launched <laughs> right. the program is the consent. You absolute dunce. Why does this exist? In, in and, what world? In what world would you install the game and log in twice and then be like, actually, I'm not feeling it. I I don't know about this. <laughs> oh, you're gonna make changes to my computer. I don't want any state changes to happen to my computer. My goodness. <laughs> Only RAM. Don't save anything to the hard drive. Ah, oh, it's so it's so dumb. That like this makes no sense. Like, why would you design it this way? And games for Windows Live had the same problem. It would launch the game, and then it would notice that games for Windows Live wasn't up to date, and it would close the game to update itself. And you're like, well, why? No. Why didn't you do that? Oh, that that absolutely happened multiple times. No, that's not yes. possible. How could you but design it, something that completely incompetent? How would it run right? if you were that bad at programming? <laughs> right. I, I mean, it would do that for all kinds of things. It would like, oh, you launch the game, and then you and then you get into the game, and it logs you into Games for Windows Live, and then and then it would say, oh, Games for Windows Live needs to be updated. So then it would force you to exit the game, so that you could update Games for Windows Live, and then you launch the game again, go through the loading screen again, and then it's like, this game has updates, and then you got to exit again so that it can patch the game. It's like a version of Steam <laughs> no. that doesn't come up until you try to launch the game in question, and then it would try to do its job after you launched the game. But it can't do anything because the game is running, so it has to close the game. <laughs> That was the original games for Windows Live, and it's still just, this isn't as bad, but it's still designed just so bizarrely and so incompetently. It, and then the, the, the punchline is, fine, I give it permission to change my computer, you know, yes, you may save the game to my hard drive. And then, you know, I exit out of the game and I look and I've got an email. You One new app says access to your device. And it's like, why would you email me? Yes, I'm sure I can turn off emails, but why are you filling my email box with this garbage? <laughs> oh, man. And like, why imagine you're you you making someone? a terrible car analogy where you're going on a road trip or something. You get in your car and you start the car and then like, you're going to go pull out the driveway and it's like, do you want this car to have access to the street? And it's like, what? Why? <laughs> right. Let me see your driver's license before we can start the car. Do, do, do you want, you're already driving, you're behind the wheel, ready to go, and you have tap the gas. And it's like, oh, stop. Uh, are you willing to let the car leave your driveway? It's like, wait, what? <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, it's so awful. It's just so stupid and awful. Well, what an incredible dystopia we live in these days. Right. Speaking of incredible dystopias, I 
at the request or suggestion, I guess, of a commenter on the last diecast, bought, installed, and played all the way through Beautiful Desolation, the video game. All right, I'm looking it up now. Oh, speaking of interfaces that are terrible, Steam, where you go to look at a game, you watch the first two seconds of a trailer, and then whoop, it zips off the bottom of the screen so that, it, so that it can show you a live stream of someone playing the game right now. <laughs> I know I've turned that off before, but it's back on now, so I need to figure out how to turn it off again. I'm sorry to interrupt. But then, I'm it's... not the one who should be apologizing. Am I Windows? That's right. Go ahead, Paul. Or, or Steam, right? The whole thing. Everything's dumb. Right. Uh, so so I, I bought this game, and it's like it's a point-and-click adventure game. Um, and so I figured, uh, you know, it's going to be like a few hundred megabytes. Like, you know, this is a, you know, it's got still images. It's got some animated sprites that walk over the top of it. But no, 15 gigabytes. 1.21 gigabytes. <laughs> right? And I was like, where's, where's this all going? Uh, but it turns out it's got a ton of pre-rendered content. There's like pre-rendered transition scenes when you like go to a new location and there's a bunch of pre-rendered dialogue. All the characters when they're talking have this little animation loop they do. Um, and that kind of leads me to another weird thing about the game that it's not good looking enough. Like the pre-rendered stuff isn't even as good as the kind of stuff that I can make. And I'm not like great, um, but it's clearly not ray traced. It's been like animated and rendered in some, uh, yeah. like, you know, shadow mapped engine of some in, kind. In engine cutscene kind of thing. Yeah. It kind of looks like a, it's, it's like one half a step above an in engine cups cutscene. Um, but you could have had in engine cutscenes, like if it was all in 3d, uh, for way, way, way less disk space, and it would actually look better right. because they're pre-rendered, and so they're like a little bit lower quality than you can't change the resolution of a pre-rendered video. Right. So it's just like not as good as a pre-rendered thing, and then but it's also pre-rendered, so it can't you know respond to gear changes or whatever. There isn't gear changes in the game, but you know what I mean. Right, right. So that was a little weird. Um, I got almost to the end of the game and. Then I I saved at one point and then I kept going. I'm like, oh, I want to redo a choice. And so I was just like, okay, well, reload the game. You go to the load menu. And as soon as you click on one of the things, it loads that thing. So I was just trying to like click on things to see which one it was. And I hadn't saved my game at where I was. So I like lost an hour oh, of playtime or something. Oh, no. And it was just like, and there was an auto save. So I was like, oh, I'll just go to the last auto save and see where that was. But it like but it only auto, auto saves it, at, yeah. at very, very infrequently. There's like, I don't know when it does it, but it, it does oh. not autosave often. Oh, it was an autosave. Like, I thought um, you were going to tell me it autosaves just as you load the game. So by loading the game, you would cover up your autosave. But it did have one. It was just super old. That's weird. Yeah, it was like from... I had been playing for like seven hours, and the autosave was from like two and a half hours in or whatever for some reason. Like... Why does it not autosave every time I make a choice or something? I don't know. So that was very strange. Very underzealous. The first thing you see when you go to the page, the trailer, shows you walking up to a giant metal door and a robot eye pops out and talks to you in gibberish. It's just such an obvious... The beginning of Return gibberish of the Jedi. It sounds like Huttese. Yeah, it, it's yeah, very exactly. Return to the Jedi, uh, Hut Palace, Door Guard. Montage like it's not even thing. an homage it's just a recreation of <laughs> right yeah yeah it's it's kind of strange like that's a weird thing to lead off with in your in your trailer mm. the pitch in the comment was uh that you were saying it was really cool that ghostwire tokyo had this very different background mythology it was drawing from and uh, the commenter i forget their name but i'm sure they'll volunteer to be noticed if they want this to be attributed to them said oh well this game beautiful desolation is set in south africa and it's got like this very strange different uh mythologies drawing from as well and so if you like that kind of thing you could look into it and so i was like all right that sounds interesting um but mostly it, like there there were a few points where it's like oh obviously this is an homage to this other science fiction thing um but mostly it was just very uh what 
it was like um charnel house i guess very charnel house kind of imagery like set in the far future and aliens have brought a bunch of advanced technology and there's like robots and, and like intermingled with all the organics and like everybody's skin has fallen off and a lot of people's like all their flesh has fallen off so they're just like skeletons but they're still alive but how are they alive and i don't know it's very strange it's like I, i'm not sure um where and maybe that's what they're talking about they're drawing from this other imagery or this other source of of inspiration or artistic style or something and i was just like i don't know where you're going with this it's very odd oh interesting so i would say the title is at most half true it's certainly a lot of desolation although there are some pretty uh beautiful scenes and things they set up uh but i would not call it for the most part beautiful it's mostly like bleached bones and and nasty muscly pulsy heart things wow yeah i'm watching the okay i got to the part of the trailer where they're not imitating return of the jedi and it does look pretty cool yeah it certainly has a style and i was it able does. to go through the whole thing in about mm, eight nine hours so not too long very cool so uh speaking of things that are exciting i got an email in my email inbox this week saying I hope you're excited for our Android app because we finally released it. And it's from this, I don't even know who these people are. I'm not going to say the name of it partially because I don't even remember and partially because I don't want to give them a, you know, signal boost. But like this group like sends me a, a, a picture of like a bunch of abstract characters. They're like, hey, get excited for our Android app. And I was like, number one, I don't know who you are. Number two, I... I'm sure that I'm not excited for whatever your Android app is. Number three, I'm reading this on a computer. Like, why are you... <laughs> what even is your plan here? Like, they don't say what their service is. They don't say, like, anything about what they're trying to do. I'm assuming it's a social media thing. But who knows? Why? I So I just deleted it. It was like, what? Really? Like... you? It's so arrogant to assume that the people you're sending this email to will know who you are and what you're doing oh. and be excited about it, right? It's just like, hey, I'll bet you're excited that we were, we're doing this thing. And it's like, hey, I have no idea who you are. I get this all the time. I, I uh, from my days, you know, I got on the, everybody's media lists as a reviewer because I worked at the Oh, yeah. List. And so I once in a while get uh, PR emails and they're like, oh, God. Gun War of the Gun World is finally coming out. You know, th this is your big chance. You know, we know you've been waiting for for so long to hear about this game. And boy, the drama. And it has a storied history. But now it's finally coming out. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what the game is. And it's, <laughs> it's like... I don't know what platform, like, is this a mobile game? A console? And there's no context in the message. There's no summary. There's no, like, oh, by the way, this is, a, you know, often it doesn't even say it's a game. He just takes it as, <laughs> right, just takes it as given that you know that you're being, so, like, if it has some weird name, you won't even realize it's a game. You're like, what is what is this? Is this from a social media platform? Is this is this from one of my many doctors? <laughs> <laughs> I'd I'd go to a doctor who is named War of the Gun World. I mean, that sounds pretty rad, right? Right. Uh, but you know, you, like if they have a really weird name that's not obviously a PC game, War of the Gun World is like every game on Steam. But like, if it's just you right, know. right. It's like four characters in Hindi, and it's like, okay. Yeah, what, what is this? Get ready for Ooj. And you're like, what? is this a social media thing? Is this a book? A comic? A <laughs> Some kind of crypto? A dr a dr <laughs> is this Ooj coin? <laughs> right. <laughs> is this a new drug? <laughs> Why not all of the above? Is this a new religion you founded? We're going to worship the great Ooj. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. Advice, not that I want you guys to be any better at your job, but advice to all the marketing guys out there. Give people an on-ramp, right? Just like, it doesn't have to be at the top, but like somewhere in your communication, 
provide something so people can <laughs> can get on board your thing because some context. not everybody is you yeah yeah exactly and speaking of people that are not us uh, i recently went on penny arcade and and noticed that they have a new feature where you know a lot of web comics have so penny arcade is a web comic here now i'm providing context and uh, a lot of web comics have a button where you can just go to a random comic, right? Like, click the button and it'll just select a random one out of their their archive somewhere. Yeah. And that's really nice for if you've read it over the years and you kind of want to browse back through, or you're new to it, you just want to get a sample of what the deal is. Um, but Penny Arcade recently added a new feature, which is create a random comic, where it takes three panels out of a random three comics splices them together and makes that an image and puts up on the screen. Yes, I thought this was so amusing. Like, I wouldn't have thought it would work because it requires comics to be divided into three panels and not all of them are. So somebody, yeah. you know, and some of them have words that even if it is three panels, they've got word bubbles that bleed into adjacent panels and stuff like that. Mm, yeah, but, um, yeah. But, you know, I, I don't think know they must have had someone go through their archives and just like tag all the ones that would work with this system. Yeah. Um, it is amazing because like I just rolled one and I've got three different panels from three. Gabe's drawing style has changed radically over the mm. years. Yeah. And, and he really... tends to adopt different styles for different strips. Sometimes it's, it's a, a topical one. So he tries to mimic a style of a game or something. Right. And uh, so it's really weird when you see the different eras next to each other. I kind of like his yeah. older stuff better. I, I realize maybe that's like kind of a jerk thing to say, but I kind of liked it when it was simpler. Mm, it wasn't so polished. Um, well, yeah, he didn't have as many gradients um, in it. And um, yeah, everything was made of simpler shapes. Like Gabe's head was just a bullet shape. And now he's, right. you know, he's got a cheek that sticks way, you know, his, his, his head is multiple shapes stuck together and the mouths are very complex and filled with detail. And I kind of liked the old Penny Arcade look, which was much more cartoon, more cartoony. Mm. Um, mm. But it is interesting. Kind of more like a, a super deformed anime kind of stylized and, and slimmed down and trimmed right, off. Right, right. But it is fascinating. Oh, geez, I'm looking at some now, and like even the, even Tycho's shirt changes colors radically. It used to be more purple, <laughs> and you never yeah. notice stuff like this until you see them side by side like this. How most of the randomly generated comics make no sense whatsoever and are not right. really that funny. But occasionally, one will come out and it's like, "Whoa, that's pretty amazing!" Right? right? Yeah. Um, one of the things they, they've always said about their comic is that the punchline is in the second panel. Like, mm. a punchline's in the second panel, and then the third panel is like this weird extra thing. And it's not always true, but it is certainly true more often in Penny Arcade than in, you know, comic strips you read in the newspaper. Yeah. Um, and it does make for interesting comics when you roll them together like this. Uh, that the punchline is in the second panel creates this interesting structure that I think is much better than if you were using a if you did this same thing to a traditional comic and it would just be set up unrelated set up unrelated punchline and I don't know because there's a punchline in the second panel I think it works more often yeah there's like unrelated setup punchline and then unrelated reaction a lot of times right right or sometimes you get a double punchline because sometimes they do have a punchline yes. in the third panel yes that's true so that was fun i i played around with that for a bit it is fun so what do you say we we attempt to tackle this huge mountain of mailbags before it crushes us all <laughs> crushed beneath the weight of our correspondence <laughs> beneath the weight of our failure and sloth all right First one comes from Daniel. Dear Diecast, have any slash either slash all of you on the show? Wow, there's so many of us. Uh, this episode tried migrating your Mojang account to a Microsoft account so you can continue playing Minecraft as required after March 10th. It might be some great fodder for another Seamus's rants. I know fewer than five emails from Microsoft. 
and the process got stuck on the final yes i really do own this email address it's already towed to my moyang account verification step and had to be manually restarted uh may your diamonds ever be plentiful daniel philadelphia's burke thank you daniel um i was playing minecraft like every week like every saturday that was my my go-to game on st saturday was um minecraft up until the march 10th change and um i stopped i knew this was going to be a nightmare i have not yet done it and i know i need to but i just didn't have it in me to to wrestle with microsoft because i knew it was going to be like before i read this uh, before i read philadelphia's email i knew it was going to be a nightmare and now being warned that it's, it's going to be a nightmare that just makes it even <laughs> worse because i seem to get it worse than everybody like windows seems to really have it in for me um and i talked on so, the show several times before about trying to do this process and microsoft being like hey you really should do this and i'm like okay let's try and they're like oh whoa hey we're not ready to do this yet you're moving too fast here right so I'm sure it's going to be a nightmare. I should do it before they, like, you know, turn off the migration server. They, you know, they probably left it. Oh, it's, it, we left it on for a week. That's probably enough time for everybody in the whole world to migrate. <laughs> I'll just turn it yeah. off. I did manage to successfully migrate uh, my daughter's Minecraft account over to her Microsoft account. Um, oh, you've so got now... like, you have like 12 Minecraft accounts you've got to <laughs> migrate, though. <laughs> I oh, know. you poor yeah. man. Well, so so my daughter, so I I made a Microsoft account for the kids, and then I bought a Mo Ying my, Minecraft for my daughter. But then they had this problem where it used to be like a little while ago that you had separate Mo Ying and Microsoft accounts, and so we talked about this on the show earlier. And they had Minecraft Dungeons on their Microsoft account, and then Minecraft Java Edition on their Mo Ying account. And you can't be logged into both at the same time in the Minecraft launcher because the Minecraft launcher is the Minecraft launcher for all things Minecraft. So you had to right. like log in and log out all the time to switch between these two games that they owned. It's just nonsense. So I was able to fix that problem. I think they haven't complained about it since. So I assume that it has been solved or maybe they just gave up and <laughs> played something else. But um, I think I, I was able to do it on theirs and then my microsoft account i think i was able to migrate my million account to my microsoft account a while ago so now it's always uh you know logged in there it's in that either either i've done it or i haven't tried playing minecraft for a while and so it hasn't asked me to um but then my wife doesn't even have a microsoft account of any kind so we'd have to make her one and then transfer her minecraft account over to her microsoft account and uh Honestly, I don't think that she is that interested at this point. I don't I think she's going to be like, nah, forget it. I don't need to play Minecraft anymore. What is this going to cost me in billable hours? Would it be e would it be cheaper for me to just buy another copy of Minecraft than to try and migrate this one? <laughs> Assuming my time yeah. is not worthless. Yeah. Although it would be kind of nice for her to have another parallel online account other than google um oh, but that's yeah. a separate issue so yes uh philadelphia's i've done it it is not impossible but i've had <laughs> real hard times in the past trying to do it when microsoft is like you got to get this done and then like okay i'm gonna try to get it done and microsoft is like Ooh, slide whistle falls on you know pratt fall okay thanks guys i've been putting it off it's for me it's like you know filing your taxes it's it's not even about the money it's about the hassle it's about all this paperwork and like broken bureaucracy oh man microsoft will you ever stop ruining good things right dear diecast in a stats driven shooter some games make the guns deal little damage leading to a situation where shooting someone in the head five times doesn't seem to do anything and others give the player bad accuracy but these systems can make the gunplay feel bad because it turns and turns a lot of people off like the shooting in human revolution rather than dx uh, if you have a worse sway or something then a skilled player can compensate for it but in the end the character is supposed to be bad at shooting and can shoot very well because the player compensates how can you make a system where a character not skilled with guns can shoot well, but the guns don't feel like toy guns? With kind regards, Chris. That is a, a real trick, Chris. I'd, uh, 
if you know how to do that, <laughs> I'm sure right? people would pay good money to find out. Uh, I mean, I was a fan of like the earlier Borderlands games. It doesn't make any sense. It's just, oh, you're higher level than this guy, so we'll just multiply your your damage by some insane number. So you run around with a crappy weapon shooting people that are, you know, 20 levels below you, and they just explode. <laughs> you, know, you shoot them with, like, a, a just a stupid pistol, and they just get obliterated as if you hit them with a rocket. It makes no sense, but in a comedy game, it, it works. Sure. But, like, that, on, that only works because it's a comedy game. The moment you try and make any of that serious, the well, moment you try and, yeah... Go ahead. This is kind of the opposite question. He's asking, a character that's not skilled with guns can't shoot well, but the guns don't feel like toy guns, right? So, like, if, if your in-game character is not good at shooting, then no matter how good you are as a player, the character is still limited. Right. Well, I guess I was just saying this system, I mean, it cuts both ways. If you're shooting at somebody 10, 20 levels above you, you'll do no damage. And that yeah, feels... Yeah, it'll just be like a bullet sponge. Right, and that that's also, in a comedy game, that's that's all right. You're just shooting this guy over and over again, and there's something deeply hilarious about just, you know, 50 rockets to the face, and it chips takes a tiny chip off its health bar. Like, that's absurdist. I mean, it's not fun, but it is absurd. So it at least plays to the to the absurdity of the world. But as soon as the game is serious, as soon as you're like, this is Deus Ex and this is super serious, that falls apart. And a player is like, come on, I shot this guy in the face and he didn't even blink. That's nonsense. I kind of like how um, a lot of modern games do it with the size of the reticle changing based on how accurate you're going to be or how accurate you feel like you're going to be. Yeah. So then a, a character Did, with a really low shooting skill, it just, you know, the reticle takes up half the screen and you're going to have a huge amount of spread. I like that too because you can kind of feel, it telegraphs how bad you are at the gun or how bad the gun is. Mm, right, right. Or you know, how fast um, you're running or how unsteady your support is or whatever, all the factors that go into right. it. Right. If, if I've got a big unwieldy gun and I'm not skilled with guns, and I'm running, then the, the reticule is just going to be spread all over, and it's just, just... You're just aiming a fire hose in their general direction and just hoping some of the... Just hoping to hit them. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't think there is a good way to do it in a game trying to be taken seriously, because it's inherently a ridiculous idea. Oh, um, what, that you'd have that much spread? No, that... That a a person who okay the um the point of the rpg system is to kind of negate your ability as a player like in the real world i might be terrible at using a gun but if i manage to hit you with a bullet it will still kill you just as well as a bullet from a skilled like once the bullet hits yeah, you it doesn't yeah, matter true. The, the skill of the person that shot the bullet right um and and that's something, but if it's an RPG, you want the leveling to mean something. And so you have to, in some way, negate the basic facts of firearms. And, you know, if I shoot, even if I'm a terrible shot, if I shoot at you 50 times, instead of hitting you with 50 bullets that do a tiny bit of damage, what really should happen is I should miss 48 times. And then when I do hit, it kills you. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I think that I think the reticle thing size would work for that. Well, then it makes it really chaotic. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, that's it's, that's what you're trying to do, right? Um, I don't know. That that might feel bad though to play is having this extreme chaos, where it's like you know you miss twenty times and then you hit them once and they fall over dead. Like any time you're trying to video game firearms you need to like turn the damage down so that everybody can take more than one bullet because you know real bullet <laughs> combat yeah. is just such a dice it's roll. like super hot right yes it's like super hot oh you got hit but well, that's it for you and it's not yeah if you're not playing super hot if you're trying to, if you're playing a game where you need to overcome dozens and dozens of foes then the 
gunplay must in some way be ridiculous. Mm. It has to be. Mm, yeah. Or you have to be, I suppose if you're like a robot man. Yeah, I guess the, the entire premise of a stats-driven shooter is kind of inherently silly. Unless you want to get really simulationist with it. I could imagine a, a stats-driven shooter that's like all about your endurance level so that you, like your your gun um you know stays steady even after you've run a long distance and oh, like right. give you a you know, some to kind of your breath James kind of thing a born yeah like a born kind of thing where he's like you know you have to up your you've got to train to get all your stats up and then you can yeah hold your breath and you're steady and you can like you know aim while you're in midair or whatever acquisition time and then you could it wouldn't really be a shooter so much like it would just be kind of a first person rail game rpg right like your character right. would be doing all the aiming and shooting you wouldn't because then because then it would, the player skill would be limited in the other direction right if the idea is that you're playing as this character who can become so skilled that they can do all these things that the player wouldn't be able to do with a mouse and keyboard because there are a lot of things you can do <laughs> with a real gun right like you know, can stick it around the corner and and shoot it around the corner I'm playing as Jason Bourne who can, like, you know, draw out a pistol and headshot somebody from 50 meters away. That's his ability, but my ability as a player is I'm, like, not comfortable with mouse controls. <laughs> so the whole right. thing is, like, I'm Jason Bourne, but I forgot to put my contacts in this morning. <laughs> right, right. So you'd really have to take, you'd really have to take either the stats-driven stats part out, or you'd have to take the shooter part out, I think, to really make it sensible right or just go for comedy i i mean there I, you go there's a lot to be said for just embracing the inherent stupidity and weirdness of the world and just like yeah let's just make the world ridiculous that's okay too um i think too many games try to portray their their ridiculous worlds as super serious and it comes off as kind of infantile I'm looking at you call of duty all right, well, so now we've come to the part of the diecast mailbag where uh, Nick has sent us six questions all in a row. And um, so I'm going to read the first one, but uh, Nick, there's no guarantee that we're going to read these all in a row, and there's also no guarantee we're going to get to them this week. Okay, so this is basically a deposition now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm not sure what Nick has against us, but we'll try and get through this. We probably shouldn't be answering this without our attorneys present, but fine. Dear DieCast, I know Seamus enjoys hearing about the weird ways that we consume his blog content with regards to the DieCast. Specifically, the first episode I listened to was episode number 200. And at that point, I decided to go back through the back catalog, starting with the very first episode, whilst also listening to each new episode as it was released. Do many listeners consume the DieCast content either out of order or years late like me? Question mark. I think that's a question for the commenters, not for us. And uh, does Seamus have any access to any statistics? Uh, that would be a question for you, Seamus. I have no access to any statistics on what episodes get listened to or how much because I just serve them as raw files on my website. I would love to like, oh, wow, this episode was really popular or nobody cared about this episode. Like, what matters? Subject matter, title time of year do some time of the year get more attention than others do people listen more in the summer or in the winter um i would love to know all those things but um yeah i i have no way to to track those numbers with the setup i have okay continuing with the email now after this is nick again now after listening to every diecast episode at least once i feel qualified to summarize my entire diecast experience into the following four short questions. Number one, after it was suggested to you on multiple different episodes over the years by both Chris and Paul and possibly also Josh, Seamus, did you ever get around to playing Frog Fractions? Damn it. <laughs> no. No. Number two, did the satisfactory developers ever get around to patching in correct inverted mouse controls for driving vehicles? Uh, I haven't checked since I rage quit the game in blog post form, I think a year ago, and I have not, I mean, it's a big game and I don't want to download like all those gigs just to see if they fix that yet. So can anybody that's playing the game these days tell me, did they fix that yet? Number three, do you have Minecraft open in another tab right now? 
Oh, uh, see, normally, normally I would be busted. Back in the old days of the diecast, when it was like four people on the show, there'd be long sections where it's like two other people are going to talk about an MMO that I've never heard of and don't care about. So I just tab over to Minecraft and, you know, work on my house or whatever. Uh, but, like, since it's just you and me, Paul, uh, I really can't do that because I, you know, if you're talking, you're talking to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, uh, so there's there's no part where I'm not needed. Um, and, of course, now I can't do that because I haven't migrated my my Mojang account. You know, I used to, I thought it was pronounced Mojang, and I used to jokingly pronounce it Mo Yang because I thought that was a funny way to pronounce it. You know, haha, do the J is a Y thing. That's hilarious. A, a hilarious mispronunciation. But then I hear mm -hmm. you saying Mo Yang. So maybe I've been jokingly calling it the proper thing after butchering it. I don't know which is that correct either, but I I think I've always pronounced it Mo Yang as well. So yeah, whatever. Mo Yang is more fun. Yeah, but you know, right. as an Anglo-Saxon, you know, just most English speakers would say Mo Yang when they saw that. But that's less fun. Right, right. Uh, and number four, of course, the obligatory question. Hey, Seamus, did you hear the RSS feed is broken? I don't even know if that's a joke anymore. Yeah, you did address this in a blog post, I think, a few months ago. Right, it breaks, and then and then I'll find some plug-in that promises to fix the... Oh, do you want to do a podcast? Here, use this plug-in, and like, it never, ever works. I don't know why this has to be so hard. Like, podcasts require very special tags to go on, like, any of the po podcast sites, right? But these tags are not difficult to set up. They're very standardized, and they've been around for decades. So there's no reason this should <laughs> this should fail. This should absolutely 100% work, completely turnkey, out of the box. And I don't know why it doesn't. And I've thrown up my hands, and there's just no way to get it to work the way I want it to work. So that's another reason we don't have any stats, is I can't just like put the thing on iTunes, provide the RSS feed, and it's like, that's incorrect. You don't have the tags. This isn't a podcast. And so like <laughs> It's like, hey Seamus, do you know your RSS feed is broken? Uh yours cumulatively, Nick. Thank you, Nick. That was lovely. There are four more of these. Oh man, so not only did he send us in six questions, but each of the questions are like multi part questions. I think that may be the longest one, but uh I've already answered one in the previous one I did with Leia about three D modeling, so yeah, we're we're Almost halfway through. Next questions. All right. Let's, let's keep going. Keep try. Dear Diecast, when playing a linear game with collectibles or secrets to find on each level, it's not uncommon to find the path ahead split off in more than one direction. And at this point, I ask myself, what path is the game designer most likely to trying to direct me? And then I proceed to ignore that path at all costs until all the paths have been completely searched. Just one of the things I've found that I've conditioned myself to do over the years, always checking behind the character when the level loads in, do the occasional secret the level designers hide behind you at the start. I find it funny that the intention of a good level design is to subtly lead the player in the correct direction through the leveling, yet so often I find myself actively fighting against the, what the designer had in order to play the game the optimal way. Have you, either gentlemen, experienced a similar phenomena? Oh, and can we all please just agree, when a branching path inexplicably leads to a cutscene and a checkpoint that won't allow you to backtrack, that this is a crime against humanity that should not go unpunished, exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point. Yes. Yours contrarily, Nick. Very much agree. The game with collectibles and with unmarked one-way doors is just unforgivable. And over the years, I've come to, like, kind of hate collectibles in games that aren't that have distinct levels like oh go through this building that is you know a big murder dungeon that the if there are collectibles they break the flow of the level there's the intended behavior of just being pulled through naturally led by the architecture except you've got to stop in every stupid room and like check behind the door and check behind the and move this and check for the weak wall and oh there's something if i jump up on there can i get over this wall and can i get over there and, and so 
like I feel like a building inspector. Like it takes all the fun <laughs> out of the game. Instead of just playing the friggin' game, I've got to stop and interrogate every stupid room. Right. That, if you imagine that you're a, a building inspector that just loved doing parkour and it's like, oh, I really want to just like dive through this building, but no, I've got to like get out my clipboard, and do a survey. Exactly. Yeah. So over the years, I've just become just less enthusiastic about collectibles and secrets in general. Uh, but, you know, maybe that's just a product of like how they're implemented. Like, just, here's a but here's 50 widgets are randomly hidden on this level, and it's like, that's too much. It should be like every level has one secret. Yeah. I like the way that Breath of the... Well, I like and don't like the way Breath of the Wild did their Korok seeds, where they provide you with more than you actually need in order to get all the upgrades that you really want. Uh, I think it's like twice as many or something, so you don't have to find all of them. But also, there's like 900 or something, so that's too many yeah, still, right? Many, it should be yeah. like, you can find, you know, 50, uh, but you only need to find 25, right? Like, that would be fine. Right. Although for an open world game, maybe it's more, but it doesn't have to be in the hundreds. Definitely doesn't have to be in, in the hundreds. That's too much. Uh, I think my favorite, my favorite secrets or collectibles are the ones where you can plainly see it, like... Oh, look, mm. there it is, but I don't know how to get it. And so that telegraphs to you, okay, this, the secret door you're looking for is around here. It's in the previous room, this room, or the next room. You don't have to, you don't have to interrogate the entire map to find the secret. You just look right. around this right. area. And so it's a little fun diversion. It lets you get some goodies, but it doesn't turn the entire... You don't have to turn into this forensic investigator on every level, on every room of every level. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Satisfactory did that pretty well with the, the little scanner, where you can just turn the scanner on yeah. while you're wandering around. And then if you're near something, it'll start beeping. It won't tell you where it is, but it'll be like, hey, you can look around here and you'll find a thing. It's like, oh, okay, that's that's pretty cool. I wish that you yeah. could have it scanned for all the things or like multiple things at once because that would be nice. But, you know, it's something. Yeah. And uh, to answer Nick's first question, yes, I, I definitely do that. Where I, Oh, here's a map. I'm going to, you know, do a zigzag pattern across the whole thing, scour it for clues or whatever. And uh, if the game is too big or too boring, it, that can be a chore. But I like to think that if the game is worth playing, that that's actually kind of rewarding. That's another thing. If you're just uh, running through a game real quick, if you're if you're a casual fan of this genre, then having a lot of collectibles and secrets and stuff is just tedious. It's like, no, I don't care. But if you're really into a game, then you want to like squeeze every drop of gaming juice out of it. I'm gonna get all the collectibles and find all the secrets and all the hidden documents and all the secret endings. Mm -hmm. Unlock all the characters with all the hairstyles. <laughs> Get all the materia. All right, another one? Hit me with another one. Dire Deercast! Have you ever caught your subconscious trying to use video game logic in the real world? The best personal example I can think of relates to Metal Gear Solid V, which had shipping containers in the open world map that your character could capture for resources. And for a while after playing the game, whenever I spotted a shipping container in real life, for that half second, my subconscious would try to tell me to run over and capture it before my brain would wake up and gently remind it that I'm not, in actuality, a legendary soldier. Another example would be imagining the best way to rack up points by skating through the local urban landscape via Tony Hawk, even though in real life I'm sure that I would struggle to even stand on a skateboard. Yours dissociatively, Nick. Thank you again, Nick. Uh, yes, this does happen to me. Um, not as much as maybe... Uh, I deserve, but yeah, it's this is a, a weird thing that happens to your brain when you set it to solve problems in video games, and then it's like, well, I'm just gonna keep solving those problems. Uh, on the rare occasions when, okay, I don't live in a really big, impressive city, so we don't see a lot of incredible cars here. You know, we don't have supercars around here very often, but once mm. in a blue moon, something exotic will roll through town. And I'll see it, and I'll just get that that flash of Grand Theft Auto logic. Like, I should just... Oh, that's rare. <laughs> you don't see that very often. I should jack it. 
<laughs> right? Just go out, yank him out of the seat, and drive away, and then realize I'm not in a video game. This is a terrible decision. <laughs> and that car's door is probably auto lock. <laughs> yeah, go over and awkwardly jiggle the door handle, and then get flipped off. <laughs> if I tried to punch through that window, I would probably break my hand. I'd like to imagine that if I went over and tried to open it and got flipped off, it would just do the Grand Theft Auto thing where you go, <clears throat> wasted. <laughs> you know, you just collapse, you ragdoll. Right. You'd wake up in the hospital. <laughs> right. Um, like, what else? What I know I've done this, but I can't think of any uh The Witness, any maybe? Times. No, The Witness never made me think of video game stuff. Hmm. Uh, I know, you know uh, playing Space Chem like really got my brain into uh, like a process oriented mode that I don't know if I ever stopped doing that really because it's like if you can generalize it's just like oh oh I see I'll shorten this path and simplify this process and like straighten the lines out and yeah. I used to live near the train tracks and uh, I am a huge fan of just trains in general just aesthetically I just find them the most captivating like things that people build i just love trains like e even when they're like dirty rusted you know uh corrugated metal warehouses next to old train tracks and and everything i i love that entire feeling it kind of spooky it's kind of a liminal space it's kind mm. of haunting um but back in the day every time uh went by that this one area of train tracks oh well for a while i thought oh that looks like left for dead because left for dead uh has a lot of train tracks in one of the episodes and sometimes i'd look at it and th and think boy this really feels like place for a combine ambush you know oh, especially if they're yeah. like barrels all around and it's just this crappy industrial setting again i just kind of dig that old rusted shipping containers and chain link fence and you know train cars all over the place mm, yeah really cool places also um the fact that the train went through that neighborhood um and was loud as hell did a great job of depressing property values enough that we could afford to live there so that ah, was... <laughs> there you go everybody else hates trains and thinks they look terrible and hates the noise and uh we don't you're like i'm just right. happy to have a roof over my head right exactly but e, e, when we when we moved out of that place that was the last place we lived and then we moved into this one and every once in a while one of us will go i miss the train because you can't really hear it from Aww. where we are now when uh, we lived at a, in a townhouse for a while it was a three-story thing we were on the top floor and it was like one more apartment next to us and then like a small parking lot and then the train tracks and so it was very close to the train tracks oh that's a bit too close <laughs> yeah it was for whatever reason like the trains wouldn't blow their whistle when they went by because we weren't by a crossroad but um for whatever reason when the trains went by like the resonance of the train cars and like the resonance of the building would sync up and so the whole thing felt like it was just like slowly you know like bouncing up and down you know that kind of train car cadence of like ka-chunk ka-chunk a chunk oh a -chunk. yeah yeah uh the whole house you know would just kind of sway and bounce a little bit you know maybe maybe like a half centimeter you know you know a quarter inch or something but it's just this very weird feeling until you got used to it that sounds like that would be really awesome for like an evening but like after a while <laughs> that'd be pretty friggin' old <laughs> yeah well you learn to ignore it right anything that's around right. for a lot you you just learn to ignore it which is i think is right. kind of what what nick's talking about here like you know you you're doing all this stuff in games, and it's like, oh, your brain just like, oh, that's just normal. It's just normal. You just do it's that, just right? Normal. You just jack, just jack a supercar, right? Like this is just normal. <laughs> right. It is a rare one. So, like, is that even illegal? <laughs> you can't yeah, get arrested for that. Right? It's only one star. <laughs> it's only one star. But, yeah, that's the most unrealistic thing about Grand Theft Auto is that stealing a stealing a a uh, half million dollar supercar will only earn you one star and it'll go away after you drive a few blocks and not you will get five <laughs> stars that hound you for the rest of your life <laughs> for your life that's right you'll be hunted down forever for this oh man mm. 
I haven't played a lot of skating games, so I've never got the the impulse to like just bust some sweet skateboard moves. Never went over any sweet jumps. No, I, not really. I don't know. I guess I need to play some more games that would encourage me to do foolish things with my fragile human body. Right. Um, I don't know, but the time I'm going to be spending in the hospital over the next few months, I had the opposite happen where stuff happening to me in real life influenced what kind of games I wanted to play. Being in the hospital last year made me want to play Two Point Hospital. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, that might, you know, that bug might bite again. You know, I get I get surgery coming up, so um, I might get back. And there's and there's DLC expansion for Two Point Hospital just came out a couple months ago. So <laughs> lucky me, I knew I knew this was good for me. My lucky Yay. day. All right, I guess we've done a show. Yeah, we started kind of an odd time, but uh, yeah, I think we've got about an hour. It's close enough. All right. If anybody besides Nick has a question for the show, you can email us at diecast at shamusyoung.com. And you know what? Nick Nick can email us too. It's okay. <laughs> um, thanks to everybody who's sending questions. Say goodbye, Paul. Sayonara. Ogashimasu.